Hitchhikers traveling along the I-10 in the Texas Hill Country are picked up by seemingly nice men offering them food and shelter in exchange for help at a nearby Texas ranch. But once they arrive at the ranch, things are not as they were promised. Instead, the men were chained, tortured, and forced to labor on the ranch. If you like true stories of the macabre, strange, and paranormal, then click on that subscribe button and ring that notification bell so you can be notified every time a new episode of Grim Events is uploaded. Without further ado, I give you the true story of the Texas Slave Ranch. Where to begin with this twisted tale? There are so many things to cover, so I guess we'll begin by telling you about the Ellibrocks. Walter Wesley Ellibrock Sr. was descended from German immigrants who settled in the Hill Country in the mid-19th century. He grew up on the ranch that his ancestors built. His parents owned the general store at the crossroads in the small town in Mountain Home, Texas. He married a woman named Margaret and together they had one child named Walter Wesley Jr. in 1952. Everyone just called the younger Jr. The newspapers described the Elder Brocks as Texas ranchers, which was anything further from the truth. They were more like them hillbillies out of that Deliverance movie. Now as for Wes Sr. and his son, they were essentially cedar choppers. They ran a small herd of skinny cattle, but they made what little money they did from selling firewood, cedar posts, and keychains with trinkets carved in the shape of rolling pins, hearts, hunting knives, or whatever else suited their fancy on which they painted sayings like, Jesus loves you, peace, hope, and love, so on and so forth. Now, Wes Sr. actually bragged that he was going to become the keychain king of Texas and that he can make $1,000 a day selling the keychains on the courthouse lawn on market days, which is kind of like, you know, first Mondays or trade days. The locals thought they were weird but harmless hillbillies. West Sr. and Jr. would drive into town and go door to door with a load of firewood and a bucket of keychains. Most merchants, though, did not want them coming into their stores because they were dirty, stank, and sometimes barefoot. Now, Wesley Jr. grew up to look like a shorter clone of his old man. Fully grown, he was five foot three, stocky, nearsighted, and wore glasses with black plastic frames and lenses as thick as the bottom of a Coke bottle. In high school, he was so quiet, slow-witted, and odd that his classmates and teachers thought he was borderline retarded. One classmate remembers that he refused to take showers after gym class, and one time the coach yelled and cursed at him to strip down and get his quote, goddamn ass in the shower. Now, here's where things get a little bit interesting. Junior married a redheaded from Fredericksburg, Texas, and next door Gillespie County. She was a couple years younger and slightly taller than her husband and weighed less than 100 pounds. There were rumors, though, that she was a kidnap victim, snatched by the old man when she was still just a girl. People remember a lawsuit by her parents trying to get her back, but has disappeared from court records. So, it could be true, it could be not true, but eventually, she wound up marrying Junior. They say that she could handle a rifle and gut and skin a deer as skillfully as any man. They lived next door to the old man in a trailer house. They had one son in 1974 who they named Walter Wesley Ellibrock III. Now, I told you that Walter Wesley Sr. was married to a woman named Margaret. Well, one day, Margaret ran off with a drifter, and man, it made the old man mad. And that's where his hatred for vagrants and drifters started to come to light. After Margaret ran off with the drifter, there wasn't many women around Mountain Home for a company, so Joyce, who is Walter Jr.'s wife, was glad when a 23-year-old California girl named Sherry married one of the ranch foremen, Mark Hamilton. Hamilton, a blonde-headed, blue-eyed, six-foot-tall guy, oversaw the cedar choppers. The newlyweds lived in a trailer house in the compound with Junior and Joyce's trailer and the big house. Sherry's job was to clean the old man's house. After the keychain factory there got burnt to the ground, they didn't have enough money for electricity or running water, and it was freezing cold in winter and hot as hell in the summer. 
Piles of dirty clothes, coke cans, empty bottles, boxes of junk, old magazines, and yellow newspapers cluttered all the rooms of the house. So, needless to say, nobody envied her position. And that is the rundown on the Elderbrock family. So, let's go ahead and start talking about the crime. The Elderbrox would cruise the desolate stretches of Interstate 10 between Mountain Home and San Antonio, Texas, picking up hitchhikers and offering them jobs cutting wood on the ranch. Sometimes they drove an old yellow bus and other times a battered blue van. So the first victim we're going to talk about, or not quite a victim, but maybe a willing participant, is that of a middle-aged drifter from Colorado named Pete Johnson. Now Pete Johnson was hitchhiking right outside of San Antonio when this yellow school bus stopped. The driver of the bus, Wes Sr., asked if he was looking for work. He told him that the first 30 days would be an unpaid apprenticeship, during which he would get meals, a place to sleep, and a pack of cigarettes a day. If he made it through the trial period, then he would be paid a percentage based on his productivity. Pete said yes, and he climbed on in. When Pete arrived at the ranch, he worked 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, carving keychain trinkets made from cedar branches in a shed that the Ellabrox called a factory that was equipped with saws, a lathe, and painting supplies. Soon, cooking for the hands was added to his job duties. Now, during Pete's first stay, which lasted about three months, Margaret still lived with the old man and she kept the house fairly neat and clean. Pete was allowed to come in and visit sometimes, but he slept in, quote, the tube shack, also called the rubber room and the twilight zone by other members that worked on the farm. There were usually 10 or 15 transients on the ranch, sleeping in the tube shack and other buildings scattered around the property. Now, during most of Pete's first stay, they could come and go as they pleased. But one night near the end of his stay, Wes and Junior, armed with guns, chased a young man through the woods. They caught him and dragged him back chained him to a lathe in the keychain shop and made him work for three days. Pete felt sorry for him and would take him food and water. Finally, Pete slipped in and cut the chain and freed the man. Now, later on down the line, the Ellabrox lawyer would claim that this young man had stolen from the other men and the Ellabrox were just carrying out a time-honored frontier custom of vigilante justice. A few days later, Pete decided to move on and told the Ellabrox he was leaving. They did not object, but they didn't offer him a ride to the interstate either, so he walked. It was dark when he reached the interstate and he began thumbing for a ride. A state trooper stopped and briefly talked to him and then drove on. He thought he had a ride a few minutes later when another vehicle stopped, but it was Wes Sr. with Margaret and one of the ranch hands. Wes told him that he needed to come back and sign some paperwork. Pete voluntarily climbed back in and to the ranch they went. Wes had him sign a set of termination forms, releasing the ranchers from any claims for wages or liability for personal injuries. Wes Sr. and his son were calm. In fact, the old man even gave Pete about a hundred finished keychains and then drove him back to the interstate. Besides the keychains, room and board, and cigarettes, he was paid nothing for his three months time at the ranch. Pete then hitchhiked to Tucson, where he stayed for a couple of months before he got restless again. He decided to go and visit his sister in Florida and set out on a bicycle. Okay, this man's going to cross-country trip on a bicycle. Okie dokie, more power to you, bruh. After a couple of weeks of pedaling, he was back in the Texas Hill Country and stopped in at a truck stop that was located between Junction and Kerrville. Before he left the parking lot, a black pickup truck pulled up beside him and a familiar voice said, You were leaving without saying goodbye, huh? It was Junior, accompanied by Mark Hamilton. You owe us some money, Junior said. When Pete started to ride off, Junior stepped out holding the 3030 Winchester and blocked him and told him to dismount and get in the truck. Mark picked up his bicycle and put it in the back of the truck and they drove to the ranch. 
Things had changed for the worse in the few months since Pete had been away. Margaret was gone. The old man said she'd run off with one of the drifters he'd picked up. The ranch hands were sullener and some of them were carrying guns. Junior put Pete to work cutting squares of tin and rubbers and nailing the rubber to the tin to use in patching roof leaks. He also resumed his duties as the cook. The grub was never much to brag about back then, but there was less of it than during his first day. The men were fed lots of rice, potatoes, and white bread. For protein, they got hamburger meat mixed with oatmeal. Sometimes the diet was supplemented when Junior would bring in a deer carcass that he picked up on the side of the road. Now, the man whose report to law enforcement would lead to the Ella Brock's downfall was a 23-year-old from San Antonio named Travis Boyd, who was hitchhiking near Kerrville when a beat-up old blue van stopped. The driver was an older, heavy-set, gray-haired man. A tough, old, leather-faced man in a black cowboy hat rode shotgun. When the cowboy asked if he was looking for work, he said yes, and he climbed in next to another hitchhiker they'd picked up earlier. The driver was in, had introduced himself as Wes and the cowboy as Pete. A few miles down the road, they picked up another drifter. Wes explained that they would be cutting firewood for his ranch. For the first month, they'd be apprentices with room and board, but no pay until they'd proven themselves. When they arrived at the ranch, they were already four or five other men working there. The old man told the newcomers they could earn their dinner that night by picking up trash and brush around the house. Pete fixed the newcomers' chicken and dumpling dinner. They ate and went to bed in what the ranchers called the bunkhouse, which was a decrepit old barn with gaps between the boards and dozens of holes in one wall from shotgun pellets. It was furnished with a few mattresses thrown on the dirt floor between old refrigerators, lawn mowers, engines, and other old parts. There was no electricity, running water, or toilet facilities except for an outhouse. Upon waking the next morning, Someone told them that there was a pond where they could clean up a little. Travis and another man hiked about a quarter mile down a dirt road to the pond. One of the men that they had come in with the day before was already down at the pond. His name was Robert McCafferty from Sacramento. The spring fed water was too cold for a proper bath. The three men agreed the living conditions were too rough and they did not really want to chop wood. So they walked back to the bunkhouse and told Pete that they were going to leave without even sticking around for breakfast. Pete disappeared and a few minutes later came back with Junior, who told them to get in the back of his truck. Junior drove him back to the main house, and once there, the old man came out and asked what was wrong. They told him that this was not the kind of work for them and that they were leaving and would, and would not even stick around for breakfast. The old man huddled with his son and Pete and after a whispered conversation told them to wait while he got the quote, necessary paperwork. A few minutes later they were surrounded by men pointing rifles, shotguns, and pistols at them. You're going nowhere, the old man said. We spent twenty dollars in gas to get you up here and fed you and gave you somewhere to sleep. Now you want to split. You might never be getting out of here. Boyd knew they were in bad trouble and said, just let us work a day and then we'll split. I'm gonna kill you, the old man said. You'll die a slow death because you got a loud mouth. You won't really kill me, will you? Boyd asked. Junior piped in and said his daddy had already killed a bunch of men. I've killed one, he boasted, swollen with pride. As if to stress that someone could really get shot, a gun went off behind them. When the captives turned to look, they saw a skinny, red-headed woman pointing a rifle at them. That would be Junior's wife. Junior opened up the back of the van and pulled out a brand new chain and fastened their ankles with padlocks. Boyd and his companions were then herded into the back of Junior's pickup. Mark Hamilton drove while Junior stood in the passenger door pointing the gun over the roof at them. Other men walked alongside the truck pointing guns at them. They were driven to a hog pen about a quarter mile from the main house where Junior gave them steel bars and shovels and ordered them to start digging. Junior said they would be digging their own graves before the day was out. As they worked, some of the thugs shot around their feet, seeing who they could hit the closest without shooting one of them. Joyce joined in on the fun and the torment continued until a bullet or a rock fragment ricocheted and hit Boyd in the leg. He fell to the ground moaning and holding his knee. I didn't mean to shoot you, Joyce yelled. 
I didn't mean to hit you. But when she saw that it had barely broken the skin, she told him to quit carrying on and get back to work. Junior then got out his cattle prod, a three-foot-long menacing instrument with a red handle and compartment with a battery that looked big enough to kill a horse. Take off your shirts, he ordered. You ain't working fast enough. Then he started poking them with the cattle prod. We'll make you work a little faster. As they worked, Junior continuously threatened and taunted them. You guys will do anything we want to, won't you? He said. They dug for five hours in the hot sun without water, with Junior and his gang threatening to kill him. Around two that afternoon, Junior announced he would let one of them go and ask his flunkies, which one of these guys do you think is the nicest one? They agreed the one in the middle, Robert McCafferty. Boyd whispered to McCafferty, My name is Travis Boyd. I'm from San Antonio. If you get out of here, go right to the cops, please. Junior handcuffed McCafferty, then removed the chain from his ankles and ordered him to climb into the back of the truck. When they got back to the main house, the old man came, came out holding a rope tying a hangman's noose as he walked. He threw the rope over a tree, and he said, Boy, you're going to die now. He slipped the noose over McCafferty's head and tightened it around his neck. McCafferty was pleading for his life when the old man said he would spare him if he signed some release forms. McCafferty had no choice and readily complied. Junior paused from poking him with the, with the cattle prod to let him sign the papers. The whole extended family was present. Junior, Joyce, Mark and Sherry Hamilton, Pete and a few of the other ranch hands. Surrounded by people pointing guns at him, McCafferty signed and wrote his social security number on the forms. The first form basically was saying he had not been mistreated in any way, shape, or form. And the second note said that he'd been paid what was coming to him. But the Ellerbrocks were not through toying with him just yet. Tell me why I shouldn't kill you, the old man said. I have a young daughter in California who needs me, McCafferty pleaded but that was not good enough. The old man ordered him to write that he no longer enjoyed living and so was ending his life. When he refused, they chained him to a tree and began shocking him again until he agreed to sign the note. He figured he was a dead man until Joyce asked if he had a coin. She was going to flip the coin. Tails he lived, heads he died. She seemed disappointed when it came up tails. The old man asked Pete if he had any feelings whether to let him live or not, or to kill him. Pete hesitated and then said, let him go. Junior and the old man drove him to the interstate and let him out at a rest stop. They warned that they controlled the local sheriff, and if he went to the authorities, he would end up, quote, committing suicide in jail. McCafferty promised he would not say anything to anybody and just wanted to let bygones be bygones. That satisfied the old man, and incredibly, without a hint of irony, like they had a disagreement over a fender bender in town, he said, No hard feelings, right? They drove off, leaving McCafferty alone on the side of the road. He caught a ride all the way to California, and true to his word, did not call the police. The threatened hangings, suicide notes, and coin tosses were apparently regular rituals that the Ellibrocks practiced when they tormented their victims. They went through the same routine with the second man that they released that day. He was so frightened that when they put him out on the side of the highway, he ran into the brush without his suitcase. Junior ordered one of his henchmen to throw it onto the shoulder of the road, then drove off. He circled around, and when the man that had run off into the brush turned around to grab his suitcase, Junior ran it over and it exploded, scattering all the men's possessions all over the highway. Travis Boyd was the last of the three men released that day and suffered the same ordeal of the mock hanging, forced suicide note, and the coin toss. He promised he would not tell anybody what had happened, caught a ride, and was glad to get out of Kerr County alive. Back at the ranch that evening, Joyce made a big old bowl of red jello for the men at the bunkhouse. When they started to eat it, they saw it was molded around a piece of raw, bloody meat. She cackled and said that Wes had cut it out from one of the men that they had taken that day. Boyd caught a ride towards San Antonio, then a ride north with two boys who believed his story. He told them he was afraid to report it to law enforcement, 
By the time they'd got to Land Passes, over a hundred miles away from Kerrville, he worked up the courage to go to the police station. To Boyd's great relief, the police chief believed him and called the Texas Rangers. Now, this concludes part one of our story on the Yellow Brox, but it is far, far from over. There's just too much to put into one video. So the second video, we're going to talk about the trial and about the actual murder that did occur. So if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel so that you can be notified as soon as we upload the next video. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a blessed day.